given the news of what happened with Governor Cuomo, I thought it would be really interesting to get Alessandra uh, Biagi to weigh in. She's a Democratic uh, New York State Senator in the 34th District, representing Bronx and Westchester. And uh, we just asked her to pop in. Hi, Jarrett Keller. We asked her to pop in and kind of give us her reaction and what she's hearing from her constituents. Hi, everybody. Um, and if you all have any questions um, that you want to ask, we solicited some from social media. Um, we'll be glad to try to get them in. And if you have any comments uh, <clears throat> about that Governor Cuomo is resigning in 14 days, feel free to uh, weigh in on the comments. Hey, hey, Senator, how are you? Hi, Katie. It's so nice to see you. I'm doing okay. I'm trying to get my light to be sufficient. I don't know if it is. I'm not in my, my own home tonight, but I'm making it work. We're making it work. Great. My, um, my little ring light broke, so I'm making it as <laughs> This is my ring light, but what are you going to do? And right. thanks so much for joining us. We're not going to do a long, drawn-out thing, sure. but I really thought about you as soon as I heard the announcement late this morning that Andrew Cuomo was resigning. And I'm curious what your immediate reaction was when you heard the news, because certainly the press conference uh, didn't appear to be uh, one in which he was announcing his resignation. It came as a bit of a surprise, I think, to people in terms of how it was framed. So what did you think when you heard that? I mean, I was shocked because uh, it didn't, to the point that you just made, it didn't seem like that is what he was announcing at all, especially because it was preceded by his attorney, who was really talking a lot about his defense and also the fact that you know, these allegations were not real or true. And so it was it was confusing and also shocking. And I think that as the day has kind of worn on and, and time has kind of gone forward here, I think it's made me feel two very real emotions. The first is that this is obviously um, a very serious thing for a governor to do. Um, it's not something that is small or should be taken lightly. This is incredibly serious. And I think that the attorney general's report that was released last week with regard to the, the investigation around sexual harassment and assault in the executive chamber, as well as the workplace environment and the conclusions that, yes, the governor did um, sexually harass these 11 women in addition to violating state and federal law, definitely are, ser are serious enough and have really merited um, his resignation. However, I think that, again, just thinking more about it, there was no um, moment in the press conference where there was an accounting for the behavior. There was another um, moment where he talked about culture and generation and how these are things that really are lost, I guess, on those 11 women, which I can say personally, I'm not speaking for anybody else, um, I think really was not right. And, pro and pr part of the reason why I think that what he was saying was not right or accurate or true is because he talks about boundaries and how he didn't realize that the boundaries had moved. And when we think about those boundaries, I'm very much brought to 2019 when we passed the strongest sexual harassment laws in the country. It was a bill that I wrote. It was a bill that he signed and that he championed. And so he knew the boundaries. And so I, I just, I didn't find it believable. And I think that that's a very um, unfortunate thing. At the, at the same time, this is an opportunity for New York now to be able to move forward beyond what we have all lived through now for almost 18 months with regard to, it's not just this report, right? It's with regard to COVID and the response to COVID in that administration. It's 11 women coming forward in addition to a whole bunch of other things. And I think that the time now is for us to be able to actually do the work without distraction because there has been a tremendous amount of time and energy focused on this governor and the scandals that surround him. You, you were surprised. Before I ask you more about the resignation, I mean, how did you feel about the AG report? It's interesting because I think the reaction is quite mixed from the people who are watching this. There are a number of people who, who say they're sad as New Yorkers that he is leaving. Um, yes. And, you know, I think the AG report uh, in its uh, specificity and um, – uh, uh, sort of how hard it came down on Andrew Cuomo surprised a lot of people. Were you surprised uh, uh, 
when you read the report and her and initially heard about it? So I was not surprised when I read the report, but I do want to acknowledge what you just said, because I think it's important to do that, which is that there's mixed feelings about the governor leaving and also people who say, I'm glad that he's leaving and people who are saying, I'm very upset and sad. This is a very sad day for New York. So I want to just pause there for a moment because it is a sad day for New York. It's a very sad day for New York. And it's, again, this is a very serious this is a very serious um, report and set of findings. It's a very serious um, action taken by this governor. And the reason that we're in this position and moment is because of the behavior and the actions of our governor. And that might be a difficult thing to hear, and it might be something that you don't want to accept as truth. And I understand. I can absolutely understand that. And also, I think that the attorney general's report, when I read it, I was I was, again, I, I wasn't shocked in the sense that the things that were found, right, violating state and federal law, sexual harassment, retaliation um, amongst not only um, himself, but also those who work in the executive chamber. Those are things that we have heard about for a long time. And as a former staffer in the executive chamber, it's something that I lived through. I understand it. It's an experience that I I worked in, and so I understand and I knew that that was already true because I lived it. However, I think the most important part of it was that the women who came forward were found to be telling the truth. That is a significant and important finding, and also it's important because sexual harassment is something that is oftentimes brushed aside or swept away in Albany. It's something that has been hidden. It's something that you don't talk about. And this is a moment where we're saying, no, this is something that's risen to the surface. There's clear facts, corroborating evidence. These 11 women who have given their testimony, it's not just their testimony. It's corroborating evidence. It's 70,000 pages of documents. It's 200 interviews. It's 41 of those interviews under oath and a whole bunch of other evidence in the appendices of the report that just showed the thoroughness that these investigators engaged in. And so I feel a confidence in the process. And I also want to just remind everybody that this is a process and an investigation that Governor Cuomo requested himself. He asked for this to happen. And as time came closer to the close of the investigation is when we saw that he not only started to shift his narrative from I'm going to be vindicated, but he started to shift his narrative to, narrative to this is a political hit job. Yeah. You it's, know, very, it's, a, it's challenging on every level. So, you know, Sen Senator Biagi, someone asked just to ask in the comments what I was going to ask if you sort of witness this and and maybe I don't know if you personally experienced harassment when you were part of of this world I mean maybe that's the first question and the second question is if so even if you witnessed it why didn't you come forward earlier so there's two there's two things I'll share with you the first one is that in that office the culture of the executive chamber is one where if you speak up or speak out there is inevitable retaliation there is a and a, a spoke, it's not an unspoken, it is a spoken theme, which is that if you cross Andrew Cuomo, or if you do something that betrays the governor's office or the governor, then good luck to your career, you will never have a job in politics again. And I can say that just from being there in the short period of time that I was, and then leaving and running for office and having consistent calls from that office trying to get me not to run, asking me to not run, and then telling me that I would never have a job in government again, that I, how could I possibly, why was I doing this? And who did I think I was? And like, what was I thinking? That was just my experience amongst other things that I experienced. But even inside the office, people didn't speak up because the culture of fear and the culture of berating people and belittling them was like a whiplash. And so the way it felt was sometimes you would have praise for your work and then sometimes there would be a sharp reaction and a yelling and you would feel valueless just at the same time that you felt value and it was confusing and it was gas a gaslighting and it was also something that left people in a constant state of fear am I going to lose my job today is there something that I've done that's going to put me on a list that's outside of the work that I want to do most people go into government and public service to actually do the work it's one of the most meaningful sets of work that you could want to be part of and yet even on the inside when you talk about the behavior that you experience there is an inherent Okay, like, you know, keep that quiet, keep that to yourself, don't share that with other people. And it's not clear 
who to go to because the way the office is set up is as if everything is to reinforce that Governor Cuomo is the one that we're serving versus the public. It's it is a it's it is a workplace like I have never been in before. Even in the in the New York State Senate, where there has historically been harassment, abuse, corruption, misconduct, I know exactly where I have to go if I need to report something. That's not clear in the governor's office. And even if it were, the undercurrent of retaliation prevents people from doing it. And it prevented me from doing it until after I had won my seat and felt like I was in a position where I could speak out and be taken seriously and not be retaliated against. And frankly, that's not necessarily true because even as I spoke out, I was retaliated against, which is fine because I am in this business. I understand what it's about. But the point is, it is absolutely unacceptable for any person to work in government, in any office, beyond government, and to feel that they are unsafe or that there is a, an environment where they're going to be harassed or retaliated against or abused, it's, we have to eradicate it. So I know that was a long answer to your question, but there's so many pieces to it that kind of all weave together to make it, make it clear as to why wouldn't you just report this or why wouldn't you just say it? It's not as, it's, it was never that, it wasn't very clear or easy to do that. It was actually very scary to do that. Alessandra, I was going to ask you about his defense of his behavior, you know, that he's just a demonstrative person. During that press conference, he showed uh, himself sort of hugging and being affectionate with a, a lot of people. Um, what, what was your reaction when you saw that? His response to the AG's report, um, and also in today, there was a lot of that same kind of um, conversation and theme. I mean... Here's what I'll say to that. The argument that sexual harassment, or excuse me, let me, let me back up. The argument that hugging and kissing is generational and is cultural is something I don't believe. And I'll tell you why. Because a workplace setting is a setting where people, again, do not expect it to be hugged and kissed. And even if you do feel like, well, it is cultural, he just hugged people. Groping is not cultural. Groping is not generational. There are things that this governor has done that go beyond even a reasonable understanding of what a generational or cult cultural response to somebody might be. In addition to that, there have been just, it's, it's not just the 11 women. It's the inability to be honest about how many people have died in COVID. It's an, it's an inability to be honest about whether or not we're able to get COVID relief out the door because we have billions of dollars sitting in New York right now. Again, another thing, waiting to go out the door for tenants who are on the verge of becoming evicted. It's our MTA not being able to be fixed or to function because Andy Byford, a man who has traveled the literal planet fixing transportation systems in other countries was unable to stay in New York and work with the governor because it was too difficult and the environment was, was not, it was not conducive for him to lead. I mean, it goes so beyond the report that we have in front of us and also the other report with the nursing homes. It's about governance. It's about a system created not to serve the people, but to serve one man. And that is not what public service is about at all. Yeah. Uh, wait, sorry. Um, we, I wanted to ask you about the the 14 days time frame, just sort of where we go from here. Um, there's He's going to resign in 14 days. He still could be impeached. And without impeachment, he could actually run for statewide office again. Um, so what do you see? Can you give us some sense of what will transpire from here to when he resigns and and the, there are obviously some criminal cases that are underway. Absolutely. Happy to do that. Um, and also, I because I'm looking at the comments, too, and I should probably put them down. There's one thing I want to just say, which is that the way in which somebody leads an office and their, their behavior, whether it is with regard to those 11 women or governing, are all interconnected. And it's important that we at least take a moment to try to understand that. And I'm, I will do my best to try to explain that. Um, but as we continue to talk here, but it's important that it's clearly connected. Okay, so the impeachment process. Yes. Yes, sorry to interrupt. I, sure. I, I did 
comments because I thought they were disrespectful, honestly. And I appreciate people asking questions or even making respectful comments. But, you know, once they start being really nasty and ugly, I just don't want to deal with them. So okay. I turn the head and, and finish. I'm sorry. No, don't be sorry. I understand and I get it. I understand that people are, are having a reaction to this and it's not a pleasant one. And I am very sorry for that. Um, okay. So impeachment. So impeachment is important because again, resigning is not necessarily accountability, but it's not inevitable that there will be impeachment in the state of New York because the assembly has to agree to continue to go forward. Some of us have called for the continuation of the impeachment proceedings. Why? Because it is very important that this governor be held accountable in a court of law. Yes, there was due process with regard to the AG's report. There was an opportunity to be heard. People re were represented by attorneys. And now there is an opportunity for us to be able to not only have a trial in the Senate, which I would be a part of as one of the 63 members, but also to be able to prevent if we so if we see fit this governor from running for office again because if he is not impeached and we don't go forward he can run for office in the future again and i don't believe that he is somebody fit for public service anymore now i'm one person i'm one voice i represent 330,000 people and i try my best to think about what i would want for them every single day and so that's what's informing my decisions other people might disagree but i think think that today there is an overwhelming consensus that this is somebody who has really lost his way, who has abused his power, and is not able to serve today or in the future. But without impeachment, he can run again. And so that's when someone asked exactly what the grounds for impeachment would be specifically. So the, um, the legal uh, terminology for it, or the legal standard for it, is um, willful and corrupt misconduct. It is a very broad standard. It is not like in the United States um, Congress where you have high crimes and misdemeanors. It's very broad. In New York State as well, our impeachment statute is also is also very broad. And so we have work to do as a legislature to make that law very clear and to make it as fair as possible. And I want to just note that the last time that we had an impeachment in New York was 1913, which is why this has not been something that was a high priority for the legislature, because it wasn't something that we faced. And so that is the that is the standard. Now, if you look at that standard and just break it down, uh, corrupt and, and corrupt misconduct is something that we see inside of the AG's report. So I had believed prior to today, before Governor Cuomo resigned, that we did have enough information and enough evidence in that AG's report that was just released. We also have another AG report that was released earlier this year with regard to nursing homes. And so this is not just about the 11 women, although alone those 11 women and the, and the findings are sufficient. It's about, again, this, this panoply of information and this entirety of what has gone on here, not only in the past year, but also beyond the past year. And now what's extending into how we recover from COVID effectively and appropriately and sufficiently for the people who are really relying on us to show up for them so that there isn't any more harm caused or any more suffering. I'm curious, um, just two more questions and I'll sure. let you. So knowing uh, Andrew Cuomo as you do and being part of that sort of um, you know, ecosystem, if you want, if you will, in Albany. What do you think, I'm sure he consulted many advisors, his lawyers, et cetera, but what do you think prompted him to make this decision? You know, do can you, I mean, this is such a speculative question, but can you imagine sort of how he weighed the pros and cons and why he made this calculation? Okay, so I have two things that I, two reasons I believe caused him to resign. One of them is, it, both of them are speculation because I don't know for sure, so I wanna be very clear about that. Um, one of them I think is more possible. The other one is if I had to take a cynical slice on what's going on, that is what that would be. So the first one is that I believe he resigned because the assembly was getting very serious with impeachment. Now. If we still move forward with impeachment, that would obviously not be a ras rational or reasonable understanding of why he resigned. However, 
I think that because it started to feel real, like we were moving forward, that perhaps he wanted to avoid all of that and make it go away. And why I can say that with confidence is because in his press conference today, he actually had a set a section of what he said, which was, we don't want to waste state resources and time on an impeachment trial because we have so much to do in New York, which is actually the argument that many of us have been making because we have a lot to do with regard to COVID relief and COVID recovery that hasn't been able to get done, not necessarily because we haven't wanted it to, but because the governor has been unable to actually follow through on COVID relief and recovery. Okay, so that's one. The second more cynical reason I could probably come up with, which I've been thinking about a lot today, is that I think that he is trying to make his legacy not about this report, not about him resigning. He is trying to make it so that he appears to the public as if he is the victim and he is innocent and that this was a political attack. And why I can say that and, and feel some kind of confidence in that, even though it is cynical, and I will admit that right now to you, is because his, his attorney, Rita Glavin, spent the first 30 minutes of the press conference essentially giving a defense of Andrew Cuomo. So again, I can't say that either of these things are real or true, but I can say I think that the first one is definitely something that is possible. And I think that only time will tell, because if we do move forward with impeachment, I think we might see a very different response um, from the governor. But I do believe that him resigning is, is in hopes that we will not move forward with impeachment. But it, it, you believe that you will move forward with impeachment, that he will be impeached? Or um, or do you think that people will say, you know, he's he's resigning, this is a waste of time and resources, and kind of validate the argument his lawyer was making? I think that the first, first this is a decision that the Assembly is going to have to make very soon and, and really account for. But I, I am not confident that we're going to move forward with impeachment and I think that for me that is that's a hard truth to take in but it's one that I can understand even though I do believe that we should follow through with this because again this is this is only one part of accountability it's not the full part of accountability and I think that having a trial will allow the public at least to have a window into a defense the case more evidence, witnesses, but the only you, time will tell from the assembly. Think, you don't think the AG report, Alessandra, does that pretty thoroughly? Oh, Katie, I think the AG report was sufficient on its face and its findings to be able to the next day draft the articles of impeachment. I thought that was sufficient. It was evidence. It was corroborated. It had a ton of appendices and emails and information there to show that the findings of violating federal and state law, retaliation, and toxic workplace were present. I thought that was sufficient to draft the articles and let a trial begin. The assembly no, what, has taken a no, different approach. You misunderstood what I was oh, saying. I was please. reading the AG report. Um, isn't that enough for the people of New York to realize um, that this was was bad in all these arenas and to spend the time and energy and resources where it might distract. And by the way, I'm not advocating either totally. way. I'm just advocate just so people can kind of really get even a greater account of what transpired or that, you know, what he did as governor. Um, you know, I'm just saying, isn't the AG report enough evidence on its own and enough for people to understand what was going on? I think it is sufficient for people to understand what's going on if you if you read it and you actually go through and see that the findings are substantiated. There's a lot of information to make each conclusion in each specific case. But that's it's just findings because the AG's report is not a it's not a, a filing of a claim. It's not a set of sentencing. It's not sending the governor to jail. And just to be very clear, an impeachment trial does not, we don't have the power as a legislature to send a governor or anybody who's impeached to prison or to jail. It is a way that we can, one, remove somebody from office, which 
clearly we do not need to do now. And two, yeah. make other decisions like preventing yeah. someone from being able to run for office in the future or preventing somebody from receiving information or, or excuse me, money from a pension. Again, there's a lot of other things that go into an impeachment. It's not just the removal from office. Well, um, what do you think will be in his future other than dealing with some of these legal issues and potentially, uh, you know, a, an impeachment? I mean, I, what I hope would be in his future is that this is a moment for him where he can start to take accountability for the harm that he's caused and really un internalize it and really understand it and really think about how his leadership and his power has frankly harmed a significant number of people. I will say though, because I think it is, it's a very important thing to say because it, what it sounds like for me, I'm listening to my own self speak obviously, what I sound like is that it's all negative, it's all bad, he's a terrible inside and out and, and nothing that he's done is good. It's not true. There have been things that he has done that are great for New York. The problem is that when you're in a position to serve people and you're in a position to really put the needs of others first and you're in a position of power as great and as significant as the governor of, a, of any state, but especially a state like New York, your responsibility is to make sure every person around you is safe, every person around you is respected, every person around you is not only given what they need to succeed, but also that the culture you're creating from the top down is one that fosters a workplace that is able to then be put into play to serve people in the highest capacity possible. And that is where he has gone wrong. And so again, I just, I hope that this is a moment of reflection for him. And I hope that it's something that he can learn from, but I, I'm not sure that it will be. And I think that's part of what's tragic because I do think that someone with as much power and privilege and opportunity and intelligence as he has and has shown the world to have, it's tragic when it ends this way. It's, it is, it just is. And I think that we have to be honest about that too. Two more people, two more women reportedly contacted the, the state AG's office after the report was released. Um, do you know any more about these claims by the additional women yet? And I other, don't. Other people are asking Alessandra if, or Senator Biagi. I That's okay. You. you can call me Alessandra. Please do, actually. <laughs> are asking if he'll face criminal charges. Now, we know that his executive assistant has already filed criminal charges. As far as I know, that's the only individual who has done so. Um, but do you expect others to follow suit? It's very possible. I know that Lindsay Boylan has filed, has filed a civil claim for retaliation, which is one of the findings. Um, after she came forward, there was, and this is in the report, there were um, many people who came together to try to undermine Lindsay Boylan's claims, which were, ha which were found to have been true. And so I think that it, time will tell, but the Albany... Uh, county DA's office is looking into this, into the criminal charges. The Westchester County DA's office is also looking into some of the incidents um, that were in the report because some of the incidents happened in Westchester County. The Manhattan DA's office is also has also filed a criminal um, investigation to see what they, you know, whether or not the findings in the AG report rise to the level of criminal activity for the, sufficient for them to bring a claim against Andrew Cuomo. So there are still pending investigations in addition to the Eastern District of New York, which is still doing an investigation into Andrew Cuomo's, part of Andrew Cuomo's handling of nursing homes, but specifically, more specifically, with regard to misappropriation of state resources in how he wrote his book. So there are so many things that are still pending that we don't know yet. And I think that time will tell all of us because I do trust these offices to do thorough investigations. I think they take this very seriously. It is, again, this is a governor of a state as large and as important as New York. Obviously, all states are important, but New York has a different gravity to it. We have a lot more people, 19.5 million. We have a huge budget. We have a lot of responsibility here. And so I think the people who are looking into these claims in law enforcement do take them seriously. And it's very possible that there, there could be findings of not only unwanted touching, but other instances of misconduct because of the governor and how he not only 
dealt with his executive assistant, but also the state trooper. Well, certainly a dramatic fall from grace, uh, for sure. You know, you think about the beginning of COVID and that he was kind of a bright light <clears throat> in terms of how we, he was communicating with the public in those daily press conferences. And, uh, you know, it just it, pretty astounding to see what transpired in just a little over a year and how he went sort of from hero to zero. Uh, <laughs> but um, Alessandra Biaggi, uh, state senator from New York, thank, thank you for spending some time with me and giving us uh, your insight and your reaction to what happened today, which was, which was uh, I think, not totally unexpected, but still pretty shocking nonetheless. Very shocking. Thank you for having me. Thank you for letting me speak. Again, I understand people who feel upset. It's upsetting. This is an upsetting moment. Um, and I hope that we can just take this moment and see it as a moment of opportunity to have our first female governor, Lieutenant Governor Kathy Hochul, will become the governor of New York. That's a very big deal. And now we need to support her leadership Thank you for mentioning that because I feel <laughs> the first female governor of New York. And what do you know about her and what do you see for the future of New York and, and uh, you know, and, and, and beyond her, you know, her filling in now and becoming the interim governor? Um, thank you for letting me have an opportunity to say this because I think this allows us to end also on a positive note, which I think is important in this moment. Um, Kathy Hochul ha has not only been the lieutenant governor um, for the past many, many years, many years now, but she was also a member of Congress. She lost her seat um, in, I believe it was 2016, no, excuse me, 2008, I believe, because she voted in favor of the ACA. So this is somebody who clearly does have integrity and has used that integrity to serve the people who put her there. But she's also somebody who is a hard worker. She's somebody who has really put forward her, her desire and her, um, her focus on getting women elected to office and making sure that women are not only um, in government, but also in other spaces like boardrooms and in non-for-profit organizations. She's focused on getting women into rooms where historically they have been left out. And so I think that she will be a tremendous asset to New York. And it's not only for me, but I am encouraging all of my colleagues to lift her up because she will need support. It's a big job to be the governor of New York. And the road ahead is one of COVID recovery. It's one to make sure that our budget next year is going to be balanced and also responsible. It's one where we can actually make sure that we are reaching our highest heights and New York is thriving. And I, I really do think there's opportunity here that we couldn't see before because it was clouded by so many things. I think that she will be a tremendous governor and we should give her a chance and an opportunity. And obviously this is a democratic society in a democratic state where the, the, the process will play itself out. But the point is, I think that she will do an excellent job and we have to give her an opportunity to do it. Well, maybe you can get her to do an interview with me. So <laughs> I, I think I'm sure that she would love to do an interview with you. I, I will definitely pass along the message. I would love to, to, to meet her and talk to her and, and talk about her vision for New York in the future. Thank you so much. Um, Thank you. you and I really appreciate your time. And thanks everyone for watching. And, um, you know, I'm going to post this on my Instagram. Love to hear your thoughts. And it'll be featured this week in Wake Up Call, my morning newsletter. And you can sign up by going to katiecurrick.com. I know Senator Biagi reads it every morning. She is very excited to get it in the box. I'm just, I just made that, but hopefully she does read it. <laughs> it's true. It's actually very true. <laughs> Thank you, Katie, so much. Thank you. Be well.